I'm going to have to talk a little bit about my mother, and she was a member of what we call now the greatest generation. And I'm not too sure that the younger generations totally understand the trials and tribulations that those people went through during those, during those times. But I believe that the people of the greatest generation went through a lot more, a lot tougher than maybe some of the rest of us ever have. And it had to do with World War II. And a lot of my mother's personality, I think, was formed or impacted by those four or five years of World War II that, that she and my dad and my older brother lived through. Mom and Dad had gone together for a few months, I guess, before uh, World War II broke out, and then uh, Dad joined, uh, joined the service. Mom got to go with him through his training in uh, Orlando. Well, once he finished that and shipped out, uh, she had to come back to, to Weatherford, obviously, and came back by herself. They were separated for uh, two years exactly, uh, from the date he left to the date he got back. Uh, from there. So that, that created a, a lot of independence uh, on her part because she was a new mother uh, and hadn't seen her husband in two years. Um, some of it had to do with the, the separation that, that my mother and my dad went through during that time. He was overseas for two years uh, with nothing but letters and I don't think all of us could comprehend and understand what that actually meant. And I think that made her strong and made her able to survive things or make the best of things in a, in a tough situation. Mother's personality was, was, it evolved over the years. As a young adult and a young mother and a young wife, I think she was a little bit, uh, had a little bit of an inferiority complex. As she told it over the years, she was best friends with a, with a girl who was valedictorian and the two of them competed. Uh, not in a bad sense, but in a friendly way, most of their way through high school. And mom always knew that uh, the other girl would probably be, uh, have a better grade than her, but mom was a close second. And grandma was supposed to be the salutatorian, but the principal at the time couldn't find it in himself to give both the valedictorian and the salutatorian awards to two girls. The uh, principal at the time gave the salutatorian award to the boy with the highest score in the class. And mom was not given, not given the award of being salutatorian. While she'd earned it, based on her GPA, she wasn't awarded it. And she always resented that. And we got into contact with the school to see if there were records that could prove and maybe they could award her this honor after, after the fact. But turns out they had had a fire um, in the late 50s um, at that school district and there were no records um, from before then that were saved. I think in a sense it was symbolic to her of the power that men had sometimes over women and she was ahead of her time in in uh, recognizing that and wishing it weren't that way, but sometimes often not knowing what to do about it. And also some family members were not necessarily propping her up or giving her encouragement. Sometimes she was put down by those people. My dad's family was all very musically talented and they all sang and got together in, in uh, you know, what the kids now would call, got together and did jam sessions and, and sang and played their instruments. And mother was involved in that. They were all singing one day and this brother-in-law turned to her one day and said, why don't you just not sing? You're not off, you're off key. And mother took that to heart so bad that I don't think she ever sang again because I sat by her church for years and years and she would never sing. She never opened her mouth. She did not appreciate men who asserted their power. Over, over women. And until most of that family had passed on, she didn't feel comfortable talking about that. But once they had all gone, then she began to open up about those kind of things. And, and that's the sort of thing I think that impacted her more than we would think about it. You know, in her latter years, I could see her turning to him and saying, why don't you be quiet? You're the one that's making all the noise. But at that time in her life, she couldn't do that or didn't do that. And it, it impacted her overall self-worth to herself. And uh, when I started the school in the first grade, she went to work outside the home. Prior to that, she was at home. First day I got on the school bus in the first grade, well, she started a job that day um, at the uh, at a lumber company here in Weatherford. 
and she learned the lumber trade and learned a lot of the builders uh, and what they needed and how they did their business. And after several years of that, she ended up going to work at uh, one of the local banks. And after um, she had worked at the bank uh, for several years, uh, giving her interest in building and, and real estate, and stuff, she actually went and got her real estate license and, be and became a realtor. And that's what she did uh, for the rest of her uh, work career, uh, probably from her 50s, I'm going to say almost 70 years old, she was involved in real estate business and actually was a realtor. And we, uh, my brother and sister and I had always talked that had mom been born 60, 70 years later, she probably would have been a home builder. She was very much a business person, uh, had a business person's mind uh, and would have been very good at that, but she just never had the opportunities to do that. In the business community, uh, she got involved in the uh, business and professional women's club in the local local area, and she was pretty active in that. and uh, uh, And she held offices at times. I never did. She never did talk about it much to us kids, but we always knew when she was uh, getting ready to go to one of those meetings and preparing for it. My name is Margaret. I'm married to her youngest son, Vaughn. We decided that we would get married in their backyard, so they had to figure out a way to fix that backyard up good enough to where we could actually have a wedding back there. It was very important for Mother to present herself to everyone else as very well put together. She, she just went all out because I just thought, okay, we'll just have a very simple thing back there. It'll just be uh, certain family members. Well, no, Jean said that's not, that's not how it's going to be. We're going to have chairs. Everybody's going to sit down. and and I didn't really have an idea as to have a lot of flowers. And she said, oh yeah, you need flowers. She wanted to make sure we used glass uh, saucers and real silverware. She would never use paper plates at a holiday. That was just a no-no. That was never gonna happen. We had the good dishes out and, and the good glassware and everything. Whenever she cooked a meal, it was very well presented. She had a centerpiece on the table, and one of the funny things I can relate to in this is I have the, the table that was my grandmother's that mother and dad had the last several years of their life, and I have it in my kitchen now. And there's glitter on that table, and there is still glitter on that table, and there'll be glitter on that table when I'm dead and gone, because mother always had a flower arrangement or candles or whatever the holiday was. There was holiday decorations on that table. They always had a garden and good food. They're both excellent cooks. There would be uh, a lot of food uh, on the table. It was always very good. To the end of her life, she had a little table in there and we would come, she would pull that table out. She would put placemats on that table and there'd be a, a flower arrangement on that table of some sort when we came in to open our Chicken Express box. You know, I mean, that was just the way it was important for her for that to look nice. Another thing about Grandma Jean was she was um, very stylish. Um, she styled herself well. She styled her homes well. She never left the house without looking really well put together. Um, always in a bold, bright color with a red purse, um, her costume jewelry, her bangle bracelet. She jokingly called herself uh, our kid's gaudy grandma. That was her term. I'm the gaudy grandma because she liked to wear jewelry. She liked to wear red. She liked to be dressed. She loved nothing better than to be dressed up. That's what she enjoyed. She was always well put together, even, even at the very end. As long as she was driving, which was well into her mid-90s, she went to the beauty shop twice a week without fail. When she was not driving as much, she got it down to once a week, and then it got down to when I could take her, which was generally once a week or once every two weeks, and that was hard for her. She was just a very stylish woman. She loved costume jewelry, um, and she would just have tons of it, and she would invite us over, especially near the end of her life, um, she knew I loved jewelry too, and she would invite uh, me and like my daughter and my mom over, and we would kind of rifle through her, her jewelry drawers, and she would let us pick out what we wanted, and we got tons. We have a whole chest of drawers. I think as she got older, I just saw a feistiness come out in her. In her later years, um, we called her the diva 
I do remember one time we came over to visit her in her apartment. We caught her, she must have been 95, maybe 94, leaning back in her chair like a little kid would do. And somebody told her to stop and she looked at him and kind of smirked and just started leaning back again and again, um, just because she didn't want to be told what to do. How, when she, it was hard for her to accept needing help and then did, did begin to accept it, she decided she liked that, and I thought that was fun because she never had that as an early in an early time in her life, and so the last several years of her life, she, she began to enjoy having someone look after her and take care of her.